My name is Angela Thompson and I wanted to greet you today with hopes for great mental health. I am a member of Lake Harbor United Methodist Church and I also am a person that attends the celebration service. So if you've not met me before today, I'd like to greet you and tell you a little bit about myself and why I'm doing this video. I am a master's level social worker who has her own private practice. I specialize in trauma, trauma treatment, and I'm nationally certified in traumatic treatment for children. And I'm also a substance abuse counselor. So I work all things mental health and I have a lot of concerns for the people I serve, my friends, my family, and the community. So that's why I'm putting this video today together. Um, I work a lot on the brain and I'm going to get into why some of the things are happening to you here in a minute. But first I want you to reflect about your own mental health in these very interesting times. First of all, if you find yourself angry, sad, feeling guilty, feeling ashamed, feeling sick, restless, all of the above or a mixture of all of them at different moments, if you find one moment your mood is up and the next your mood is down, that's okay. I really want to normalize that these are the emotions and experiences we can expect to have given what's going on. These time really reflect uh, the uncertainty and really put a spotlight on our vulnerability and fear. The buffer of our routines and norms have been taken away. For some of us, we're still able to work, whether it's through telehealth or we're going out into the public. Others of us are laid off maybe for the very first time in their life. Um, uh, maybe you are a community person that loves to get out and volunteer and you're no longer able to do that. You might find yourself lonely and afraid, unable to really truly connect with the people that Make you feel safe. This really, this COVID-19 has really intensified all of our vulnerabilities. Now, this is something that you know we all face together, and I'm hoping that this education I give you today will give you a sense of security and safety. You are not quote unquote crazy, and you'll have to excuse me. I dropped something. Pardon me for that. Um, this is truly a reflection on how the brain operates under stress. And God gave us a beautifully complex brain that has many levels and speaks different languages. So to help you normalize your experience, I'm going to share a little information with you. The survival circuits in our brain are very, very important for our survival. But unfortunately, they're not always best used in times where we are kind of safe, but the stress level is high. And this is because if I were to split your brain in half, we have an apartment type brain. So on the first level of our apartment, we have a reptilian brain. And this is responsible for our respirations, our heartbeat, our movements, our balance, things we don't think about, things we don't have to do. A lot of it's procedural and instinctual and it serves us well most of the time. This next part right here is called the limbic system. This system is all about emotions and it operates in feelings. Now the feelings we get can be all through the body, but we're better able to understand them as emotions, whereas this part of our brain, the first level, is all in sensations. In fact, it's very intelligent. It will communicate with you when it has a need through burning, stinging, numbness, hot, cold. We will get signals from our brain that things are happening. The second story of our apartment, that limbic system, or sometimes called the mammalian system, will be more of a sense of fear, disgust, anger, sadness, joy, and excitement. That speaks in that language again, and I want you to remember that. That's feelings. This is sensations. And then the beautiful part of our brain that makes us different from the rest of the mammals on this planet is called the neocortex. And the neocortex's job is to communicate through logic, empathy, and connection. This part of our brain talks in, excuse me, words and images. And when our brain is working well, 
when we're in a safety, so to speak, this works together like an orchestra and all the instruments play like they're supposed to. Unfortunately, we don't process information from the top down. So we don't process from logic or empathy. Although empathy can be an emotion down here, our ability to really be in community is more complex up here. What really happens to us is when we take in information through our eyes, our nose, our mouth, our ears, or our skin, it's all filtered down through here. And there isn't a lot of true intelligence or logic down here. Everything is based again on sensation. And right about here, which you won't be able to see on my brain map, is called an amygdala. We actually have one on each side of our brain and it's like the tip of our pinky. It's the shape of an almond and its main job is to tell us if we're safe or not. We don't get to choose what's determined to be safe or not. What happens is if this part of the brain through actually our thoughts and images, memories, fantasies, or through those five sensations, because we do process information from the bottom up, if that part of the brain says not safe, it effectively turns the temperature up and it causes us to have more and more discomfort. And at some points, if the danger is serious enough, if this is also a side of the brain, it flips the lid. And what it does is it takes the blood and oxygen away from the important parts of our brain that help us to stay logical and in control. Right about here is the prefrontal cortex. And that's where we put the brakes on our behavior. We can engage in a relationship with someone. We can understand complexities. We can be mindful. It's a really good part of our brain, but when the survival circuits are triggered, the blood and oxygen is shifted down to our body to help us fight, flight, freeze, fawn, which is um, basically the biological gift of a painless death. We just numb out or cry for help. Those are five types of that system that is based on emergencies. And depending on the level, whether it's a quick snap up and we're at the top of our range and outside of what we can tolerate or a slow increase, the brain system shut off not by choice, but because you have, up in here again, you have a whole network of survival circuits that put you into that state. So effectively what happens is that little amygdala that's right about here says alert, alert, danger, danger, and it gets all the hypothalamus, the hippocampus, and some of the other areas up in here to work on intense memory, so holding things that are important to keep us safe next time, and to create a whole cascade of hormones that go throughout our body. I'm telling you this because I really want to normalize the experiences that many of us are having, including me. You know, I do this for a living, I counsel people all the time, but I don't get out of having an amygdala that does not care about what I do for a living. And as things become more intense, just like anyone else, my brain peels back and logic can go away. We also, because we have a, a beautifully intensive nervous system, experience a lot of physical symptoms that go along with this. So once that chain starts moving in here, it shoots down messages to the adrenal glands over our kidneys. And kidneys are great, they do their job, but those adrenal glands will shoot up cortisol and cortisol goes up to the brain and causes those changes I was talking about in a moment where we're actually in danger, where we have to get away from somebody violent or our house is on fire or something like that, you don't get to choose how you're gonna survive. Those circuits are gonna do that for you. And that's why the blood and oxygen shrink down because cortisol makes the big muscle groups activate so we can effectively run or fight. That's why people are able to do things with superhuman strength that they couldn't ordinarily do because that part of our brain is so incredibly powerful. Now you might think, yeah, logic does help us calm down or you know, using coping skills help us calm down, and they do. But the nerve pathways that run through the body and brain go very slowly. Fight, flight, freeze can be in a second. Calming goes through a whole bunch of neural circuitry and that's why it takes time and intensive effort in order to make a change. This isn't hopeless. 
and I know a lot of us are struggling. So now what I'm gonna talk about is how to use our brain to calm it down. And because I work with those with post-traumatic stress disorder, those with intensive flashbacks, dissociative identity disorder, the technique I'm gonna share with you today, the first one, the most intensive one is called grounding. So what we're doing is we're going to, and I'll guide you through this in a second, use our sensation system to trick that amygdala back into safety which will effectively reduce the cortisol levels through that whole system so that we can get our thinking back online. Mindfulness is a part of this, and I'm not talking about mindfulness like you're gonna be a Buddha on a mountain somewhere melting snow or anything with your body. It's nothing like that. But what it is, it's awareness. And the more we can practice awareness in the moment, the more our brain will actually calm down when we're in situations that maybe feel unsafe, but actually, are relatively safe given the situation. So grounding. We call this the 54321 method and what we're going to do and I'm going to do with you is to take in sensations around us. The first is five and we do five visual things. So look around the room. Look for five colors, five shapes, five objects like you know I'm looking in my camera right now I can see a bag of chips I can see my refrigerator, I can see my blue walls, my lamp, and my message boards for the kids. Simple. But I take time to slow down and practice awareness and really try to see what are the details of my surroundings using our vision. Then what we're going to do is go through our body. Now the body can be a scary place for some people because a lot of us aren't attached to our body. We live in our heads and we go about our day not paying attention to aches and pains. We try to just power through things. So I tell people, go to places in your body that you feel relatively safe. They're neutral areas. So if you have had trauma, stay away from those areas. But quite generally, where I tell people to go first is to their feet. How many times do we really pay attention to our toes or the arch of our foot or the heel? Unless you have a nerve disorder or constant pain, you're probably not even noticing it. So I tell people, pay attention. What are the sensations there? Tingling, numbness, burning, pain, hot, cold. Don't judge it, but just notice it. Then go to the place like knees. When's the last time you tried to feel your kneecap? Or the tip of your nose? Or your eyes, feeling, you know, the blink sensation. You're directing your attention, and although it might sound silly, you're sending that information through the amygdala, and if you're not in danger at that moment and don't have traumatic memories associated with those parts of your body, you should be able to get a neutral feedback. Then it's three things you hear. I hear my dishwasher. I don't know if you hear that. I just heard a dog bark outside, and I heard some background noise in my house because I've sent everybody away so I could do this. That's, it's, it's relatively simple. A lot of us are filtering through sound unconsciously most of the time. We don't even hear half of what's around us. And so it's just a slowing down. And actually, it's a really good mindfulness activity if you're feeling nervous because the more you practice slowing down and just intensively concentrating on sound, whether you do outside or you put on some complicated orchestra music or something fun, you can hear instruments that you may have not heard before or birds you haven't heard before. So that's the three. Two is smell. Now I go nose blind really fast. I can't smell unless it's intense. Um, just a gift I have, I guess. So I get out different essential oils, perfumes, um, or I go outside and I try to smell, you know, the fresher odors of the spring. Um, something that's more intense, you can get cinnamon out of your kitchen, um, your favorite candle, bubble bath, shampoo, it doesn't matter, but try to get two different smells and spend some time noticing the quality. Now, smell is also our most intensive memory, and so we have to be really careful. Please don't pick out things that are tied to traumatic past, like if somebody smokes cigarettes around you, or I mean, most people don't like that smell, but if it was a certain kind of cologne, um, just different things that could be potentially alarming you may inadvertently set off your nervous system again. So try to come up with neutral smells and then try to taste one thing. So it's five uh, vision, uh, things for vision, five feelings, three things you hear, 
two things you smell, and one thing you taste. If all of it is relatively neutral, you should find yourself reorientated when you're stressed because you just used that survival system effectively against itself to turn down the volume of your stress. Okay. Another one that I generally advise people to do and was one of my favorites is a meditation called RAIN. So this means you go into a quiet place, lay down on your bed, sit in a comfy chair, sit outside, and there is a printout on this that I can give you later if you need it. And there's a actual free audio um, that will guide you through this. You can also do it for yourself, but it's really good at turning, the, again, the volume on stress down. What we do first with RAIN is to recognize what's going on. Name the facts. It's okay, there's nothing to be ashamed about. If you're worried you don't have enough food right now, that's a fact. If you have concerns for your elderly neighbor because you wanna go over and help but you don't wanna expose them, that's a fact. There are a lot of facts that may not actually be neutral and that's okay because we wanna normalize some of what's going on. Um, I wouldn't say to go through all the positive facts right now because if you're stressed, you may get a shame reaction to that. Why can't I do this? Why am I just noticing all the negative? I want you to name the stressful facts. The next thing we're going to do is allow for whatever emotions are there because they were already there. That means if you're angry, you allow for the anger. You don't do anything with it. You don't talk to anybody about it in that moment because you're basically gathering data. You're just noticing instead of denying, which can actually make our emotions more intense. When we deny emotions or we deny, let me grab my brain again, the parts of our brain that's trying to communicate with us in the mammalian part of our brain, it can make our suffering more intensive. We're doing this with a sense of non-judgment. You know, um, Pete went to the store today, people got in his face. He noticed he got angry. He noticed he was exhausted when he got home. He's trying to keep us all healthy and safe. We normalize that emotion because no, nobody wants to be angry or annoyed or upset, but it happened. If people get in your space and you're concerned for your family, your survival circuits are going to interpret that as danger and there's nothing to be ashamed of. Remember, you have a three-part brain that one part speaks in sensations, which can create that restless feeling, I gotta get out of here. The feeling part of her brain, oh, I'm really angry right now. That's okay, so whatever's there, it may be sadness, you may miss your family. It may be a lot of different things. Again, those core emotions are anger, disgust, sadness, fear, joy, and excitement. And, you know, given the unnatural times we're in right now, you may notice things that you didn't notice before. That's okay. Next, we're going to investigate with kindness. What am I believing? A lot of times we have shame-based beliefs that make our emotions more intense. So it might be, it's, it doesn't matter. It's not that big of a deal. I'm making a big deal out of nothing. So-and-so has it worse than me. Why am I getting so upset over this? It's not a very Christian thing to do. I'm being selfish, blah, blah, blah. Yes, we have beliefs and beliefs aren't always bad. Yes, we have coping skills and they're not always bad, but sometimes when our own beliefs turn negative against us and create guilt and shame, our suffering is intensified. Guilt and shame are more community-based emotions and they help us be in community, but shame itself is so all identifying that we can get lost in beliefs that aren't fair or factual. So if that's what you're noticing, allow it. Go back, but investigate where did this come from and is it really helpful to me right now? And finally, nourish with self-love. Nourish is imagining yourself using you know, Jesus or a family member or a friend or your own self-love or someone that you really admire and imagining they're hugging you. Maybe you put a hand on your own heart and you send love to yourself. However you choose to do so, the power of the imagination really sensing in, maybe it's grandma you miss and that big warm hug you used to get. Unconditional love is so important to our mental health. And it's the thing that can nourish the nervous system back to a calmer place so that our brain can work together. If we are experiencing great deals of shame and anxiety, 
you may not be able to calm yourself. And so we have to really check in and then provide love because we're all loved, we're all worthy of love, and we all matter. We all have different perspectives right now, and that's okay. You know, some of us are very fortunate on what we have, and some of us aren't. But the judgment towards others or ourselves is really destructive, and so I'm going to ask that you guard against that. Other coping skills that are really popular, one is called PLEASE MASTER. I know it's ridiculous, but it's an acronym. It stands for treating our physical illnesses, excuse me, eating enough, not too much. And I'm on that side of it. You know, I'm trying to really be careful not to visit the refrigerator as often as I have been. Um, but making sure you have adequate calories, okay, because that can affect our mood. And if we don't have enough calories, we can get into a grumpy place. But if we eat so much that sugar and unrefined carbs that, you know, can give us stomach aches, that's not helpful either. So eat relatively healthy. Now, allow yourself some sweets. That's okay. I'm not saying you have to go in one direction or another because extremists usually aren't very good for us. Uh, avoid mood altering substances, alcohol, drugs, tobacco, too much sugar, too much caffeine. There's another one of mine. I like my caffeine um, because they can stimulate the nervous system. Get enough sleep and that's hard for a lot of people right now. You know, our minds are racing. We're trying to anticipate all the different things that are going on. But allow yourself permission to figure it out tomorrow. And then there are apps for sleep, and sometimes it's music or body scan or guided imagery that can really help us fall asleep. If you're really struggling, talk to your doctor via your health portal or what you have available to you about melatonin and different natural things that you know are less harmful to the body. And if you have to take medicine to sleep, then please talk to your doctor because that's what it's there for. Exercise. Get outside, fresh air, really important if you can, if it's just sitting in your chair and moving your legs around, moving your arms, trying to get that heartbeat up a little bit. That's kind of a natural antidepressant. So within what you can do and what is safe, please do so. And then MASTER stands for doing something every day that makes you feel good about yourself. It could be a puzzle, it could be calling a friend, and if you're really depressed, it might be getting in the shower. Whatever it is, that's okay. Please take care of you. Now, there are many websites with lots of different coping skills, and I want you to consider, if you have the internet, going online and looking. But a quick list um, that I use a lot with my clients has to do, first of all, with distress tolerance. So that can be anything from prayer to meditation, um, reading, doing puzzles, uh, counting, you know, if you really are into sodoku or some kind of cognitive thing that, you know, distracts your attention from the stress. Um, reduce your TV and social media time if it's negative. It's kind of scary stuff constantly and it's important to be updated but not to focus on it all of the time. Um, then we're going to look at emotion regulation skills, that is doing things that maybe change the channel in your mind. So if you find yourself really scared, put a funny movie on. Um, if you find yourself really angry and you want to work out or you want to use that energy in a way that feels productive, like maybe you're going out and cleaning the yard right now, please do so. Then we look at things like interpersonal effectiveness. Make sure you're communicating your needs. No questions are stupid right now, and it's okay to ask for help. I have many, many more different coping skills. Those are just some that came to my mind right now. If you need more help, we do have a resource page on the website and Vicki and I put that together. Uh, there are some different places to get mental health assistance. There is also different web pages there. I have a ton of resources and information. You can email me at Maya, M-A-Y-A-10014 at gmail.com. I'm also on Facebook under my maiden name, so Angela Elwell, E-L-W-E-L-L, -E -L -L, and you can message me through that app. I'm happy to help. Um, I know I can't fix everything. None of us can, but please remember to love yourself. Please remember to practice non-judgmental stance on things. We can't change. None of us knows what this is going to be like, and a lot of times, 
Judgment is just a way of the brain scanning for safety. And we're not always, we're not always right on our judgments. In fact, sometimes our information is short-sighted. That's towards others and ourselves. Please be patient with people right now. Be kind to the cashier and the nurse, all the essential workers that are out there and are scared. Fear creates a lot of behavior that isn't maybe pro-social and helpful. But a lot of people are suffering right now, and most of us are doing the best we can. Blessings to you all. Thank you for your time, and I'll be praying for you all. Thanks.